Um, so let me just first of all try and make a quick summarizing comment uh, because I think I agree with John uh, in the main point that he was driving towards through this talk. Um, the opening point, I think, is that we shouldn't imagine that scientists, whether they're working in a regulatory body or whether they're working in industry or indeed whether they're working in a university setting, we shouldn't assume that scientists are free of the human frailties and fallibilities that uh, affect all of us. Um, and so that means that when scientists are faced with situations of evidential uncertainty, and indeed when they're faced with decisions about which forms of evidence to trust and which not to, and when they're faced with decisions of how to integrate different bodies of evidence to produce a single overall judgment, they need to go through just the same kinds of decision-making processes as the rest of us do. They need to assess the reputations of different groups. Am I going to listen to them, or do I prefer to listen to those folk over there? Their assessments are also likely to be affected by their own enthusiasms as well. What is it they care about? Where do they think research is really going? What do they think are the really hot aspects of research that are worth paying the most attention to? Now, in that respect, if we take Merton in general, we might think that he's asking for too much. He's asking that scientists in general should somehow be superhuman. But I think where this becomes problematic is where you have what John's effectively pointing to as a kind of monoculture that captures regulatory agencies, where what we have is not scientists simply being human and having human frailties, but scientists all tending to share precisely the same frailties with regard to, for example, their sympathies for industry, their enthusiasms for particular lines of research. That's where potentially assessment uh, of evidence can become narrowed down and biased in particularly unfortunate ways. That all concerns the question of how do we come to assess whether or not evidence is indeed supportive of a particular causal hypothesis, either about the beneficial effects of a drug or about the potential harmful effects of a drug? There's another question I want to move on to because John didn't talk about it so much, but I think it's absolutely central in the film that we saw this morning, and I think it's interesting for the Primados case as well. Um, and that's the question about what the proper relationship is between, on the one hand, coming to a very confident view about adverse side effects of a drug, for example, and on the other hand, the question of what appropriate regulatory action ought to be. Um, and the reason, reason why I raise this is because it's been very common over the past couple of decades, not so much uh, maybe in the period that we were talking about uh, for the Primados case, but it's been very common to think that in cases where potential grave effects uh, are in play for human health, regulators should follow what's often known as a precautionary approach. Now, the precautionary approach is usually understood as saying very explicitly that scientific certainty or even very significant scientific confidence of harm is not required for us to take timeful, regula timely regulatory action towards risk reduction. It's perfectly reasonable and will often be mandated that we should take regulatory action to reduce risk, even when the scientific evidence that we have is extremely anecdotal, maybe very, very shaky indeed, and doesn't approach anything like a high degree of confidence that the drug, for example, that we might be interested in uh, genuinely causes harm. Um, a frequent response from folk in industry, for example, to the precautionary principle itself is to say the precautionary principle, if we took it seriously, it would be an outrage, it would slow all technical progress because, after all, we can create phantom risks anywhere that we want to. It's trivially easy to generate not very well scientifically supported risks associated with anything we like, whether or not that's mobile phones frying our brains, as I think one of the uh, tabloids wrote about this a few years ago, uh, or, or whatever it might be. Now, I think the key point is that that's not what the precautionary approach says. The precautionary approach does not say any time there's even the slightest whiff of a thought that a technology might lead to harm, you should ban it. 
Instead, what the precautionary approach says is there may be grounds for taking regulatory action where there is only a whiff or not particularly strong evidence that some agent leads to harm. And the question of whether or not we should take regulatory action turns on some other questions that we might then want to ask. And what's interesting is that these are exactly the questions that we saw some of the protagonists asking during the film that we saw this morning. So if you're worried that there's a, a whiff, maybe not perfectly strong evidence, but a whiff, an anecdote, a series of decent but not perfect supportive studies suggesting that a drug might lead to highly adverse effects, the kind of questions that you need to ask yourselves are ones like, what are the benefits that this drug is bringing? Is the drug answering a medically urgent need or not? If the apparent benefit of the drug is actually rather trivial, then you probably don't want to go ahead with that drug after all. If, on the other hand, the drug appears to be answering an extremely important urgent need, you may well want to go ahead with it after all, even in the face of anecdotal evidence of adverse effects. And that, of course, is precisely why, in some cases, regulators tend to approve highly experimental treatments when they're answering to uh, life or death cases and crucially then, when the second question is answered, are there alternatives available? And that's another key. Uh, if you have perfectly good alternatives available already that do the same job, that's also when you're unlikely to think that you should go ahead with a treatment that has some uh, anecdotal suggestions instead of being much riskier. And of course, that's exactly what we saw this morning. We saw people pointing to the availability of alternative uh, pregnancy testing procedures, for example. And one might also ask the question, to what extent is a pregnancy test the kind of, uh, the kind of drug that is answering to an extraordinarily medically urgent need? Um, so all of that is pointing to the thought that there are going to be circumstances where a regulator acts inappropriately even when there is no strongly established causal link between a drug and harmful side effects. Um, I don't want to comment on the detail of the Primados case because John hasn't researched it, I haven't researched it either. The only thing I do want to make a comment on is some... Um, comments made in, in Parliament by the Under Secretary of State back in October 2016 in this context, where he seemed to say the really important thing is that first of all we need to understand what the scientific link was between Primados and these uh, adverse outcomes. And I guess, of course, it may well be important in some context to understand that scientific link, but I think what this reflection on the general nature of precautionary regulation shows is that you don't wholly answer the question, did the regulator act properly, by, first of all, thinking that the priority then is to say, well, was the causal link indeed really, really strong between Primados and these outcomes? It may well be that the regulator acted inappropriately even if the link was not conclusively established or was not even known uh, to exist with uh, significant certainty or probability. That, I take it, is precisely what makes precautionary regulation uh, appropriate under circumstances where alternatives are available uh, and where medical urgency is questionable. Thank you.